chapter 13 oh, is... I did. I did. Thank you. Chapter 13 is the introduction to real estate finance. And as I said before, you can't overstudy these two chapters. Um, there's just a lot of information in here. And for most of you, it's your first intro into finance, which I find criminal that we don't teach it. And simple interest should be taught in middle school. How to calculate interest on a debt should be something you should not get out of the seventh grade without knowing. Because people get credit in high school now sometimes, folks. You know? But the vast majority of adults in this country can't calculate simple interest on money they owe. That's a simple fact. There are probably a significant number of you in here that cannot calculate simple interest on debts that you have. That's going to change tonight. You're going to learn how to calculate interest. You're going to learn how loans function, specifically real estate loans, so they can be applied to anything um, in the finance industry. All right? So the first thing we learn about liens and mortgages in the real estate world is that there are two different theories that a state can use when we talk about mortgage loans and liens on real estate. There's two different theories that can be used. It's a statewide thing. The lender doesn't have the option of using lien theory or title theory. It's your state law is either lien theory or title theory. The one we care most about in this state, because it's the one we use, is title theory. North Carolina is a title theory state. You're taking a national exam, though, so you have to understand both theories and how they work. The good news for you is they're not tremendously different. Tell me what a lien is. Any lien, not just a mortgage lien, but a, any lien. The right of somebody who's a creditor, somebody you owe money to, to take your property, right, your collateral, and do what with it? Sell it. Sell it in order to pay off that debt, right? So, at the end of the day, aren't liens really about foreclosure? Isn't that really the purpose of a lien? If we never intended to foreclose, would we even bother placing a lien on a property? No, we wouldn't. Because it would have no teeth. The lien wouldn't matter. If there was no threat of foreclosure, I don't care, just rack them up. Right? So really, it's about foreclosure. So what do you think is going to be the primary difference between these two theories? The way what is practiced? Foreclosures. The way foreclosures work is going to be the biggest difference between a lien theory state and a title theory state. For all intents and purposes, it's the same thing. We're talking about borrowing money. We're talking about pledging a piece of property as collateral for that loan. And we're talking about the potential of having that property taken from us if we don't pay the loan, right? But the difference is going to be how they operate when we get to the foreclosure process. So let's talk about a lien theory first, since it's the simplest one. No, we don't use the simplest one in North Carolina. In a lien theory state, you only have two parties involved in a mortgage loan. You have the lender and the borrower. That's pretty straightforward, right? Somebody loaning money, somebody borrowing money. Those are the only two parties that are involved in a lien theory state. Well, here's the downside of something like a lien theory state. How do you settle disputes when there's only two parties involved in the dispute? You go to court. What kind of dispute can you imagine would come up when you're talking about a mortgage loan? Payments. Specifically, payments not being what? Made. That's the reason you have a dispute in a mortgage loan. So, if you've only got two parties involved, you've got a contract between those two parties, and they had an argument over something, where do they have to go to settle that argument? Court. Court. So, 
what would be the process the lender would use to settle this argument? What is that F word? Foreclosure. Foreclosure. Where would they have to do it in a lien theory state? Foreclosure. But where would they foreclose? In the court. In court. In front of a judge. In a trial. Because that's how we settle disputes between two parties. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Tell me something about court. Is it fast? No. No. Extremely slow. Aggravating. Expensive. Hard to deal. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So would you would you would it be fair to say then if it's a lean theory state, foreclosure is going to be a slow, expensive, tough to deal with process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All of that and then some. So, we call that a judicial foreclosure process. Now let's compare that to what we have in North Carolina and other states that practice title theory. We've made it more complex on the front end. How many parties did I say were involved in a lien theory state? Two. Two. Borrower, lender. But we still have a borrower and lender in North Carolina. You still got to have somebody loaning the money and somebody borrowing the money, right? We've added this third entity. We call them the trustee. I think of them as another word that ends in EE, -E, referee. It's their job to settle disputes. In title theory, where do you have to go to get disputes settled? In, I'm sorry, in lien theory, where do you have to go to get disputes settled? In a court of law. In title theory, where do you go to get your disputes settled? Trustee. To the trustee. That's their job. Who gave them that authority? Well, the borrower and the lender agreed up front that if we have a dispute, this person, this entity, is going to settle that dispute. Do we have to go to a court of law? Do we have to file a lawsuit? No. So which do you think is faster? A referee who has all the power to do whatever they want to do to settle the dispute or go into court and file a lawsuit. Which is faster? Title theory. title theory. The referee, the trustee, much faster. Which do you think lenders prefer to operate in? Title theory. Title theory. Absolutely. The foreclosure process is much streamlined in title theory. Kind of like liquidated damages. Very similar to liquidated damages <coughs> where the two parties have agreed up front so this is how we're going to settle this dispute, right? Instead of waiting for the crap to hit the fan and then having to figure it out, which is when you have to go to court, mm -hmm. they've decided up front, this is what we're going to do in the event of a dispute. We will leave it up. It's almost like a mediator, right? Mm -hmm. We will leave it up to them. So what do you think the trustee's job is? What do they what do? They do? What, what, what decision would they make? Is it foreclose or not foreclose? At the end of the day, the trustee is always going to be turning title over to somebody. If the loan is paid off and satisfied, who do they turn title over to? The borrower owner, right? If the lien is defaulted on, who do they turn title to? The, the bank, the lender. Simple as that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you start making your mortgage payments and they send you that notice of default, who's the first person the lender is going to contact? The, um, the trustee. The, trustee. the lender's going to contact the trustee, which is usually an attorney. And by the way, it's usually an attorney that the lender has chosen. You know, I said you agree on that, the borrower and the lender agree on who's going to be the trustee, here's the agreement. If you want our money, this is our trustee. <laughs> that's, the, that's the agreement process right there. So the trustee is usually going to be an attorney that represents the lender. So the lender, in essence, is notifying their own attorney, this person is in default. And then it becomes up to the trustee whether or not to process a foreclosure sale. Does that make sense for everybody? But the foreclosure process is still going through court. 
it goes through the courthouse because real estate records go through the courthouse, but it is not a court proceeding in the way that it's not a lawsuit. It's not a suit for foreclosure. Okay. You buy a house, it goes through the courthouse. Does that make sense? It's not a lawsuit. Somebody's still got to go to the courthouse and record the documents, right? And yes, in a foreclosure proceeding, there's still documents that have to be filed and recorded for public notice purposes. You have to give notice that you intend to foreclose. But you, at the end of the day, when you go to the courthouse as the trustee to process a foreclosure proceeding, it's not a hearing. Okay. It's a, you go up there and you tell a magistrate, here's our paperwork, this is what gives us the right to take this property, we're taking it. And the magistrate says, okay. That's the, that is the foreclosure hearing. Does that make sense? Whereas in a, a lien theory state, there would actually be attorneys and some, you know who would call witnesses and, and now most of the time does the borrower even show up? No, but they still have to go through the process of waiting for it to come up on the docket and actually presenting their case and the judge has to go decide do we want to foreclose or do we not want to foreclose? If they show up and say I need more time, they can maybe get a continuance, right? But in North Carolina, like every title theory state, if the trustee shows up and says. Here's the document that gives me the authority to take this property if they default, and here's the proof that they defaulted. The magistrate is just a rubber stamp on it. Does that make sense? And who gives the trustee that authority to just take that property away from the borrower? The borrower, the borrower does. The borrower does. When you sign those loan documents in a, in a title theory state, you sign something called a deed of trust. A deed of trust is very different from a deed. What does a deed do? Transfers ownership. Transfers ownership. Here's what a deed of trust does. It transfers the right to take the property over to that trustee. Does that make sense? So when people say, yeah, I don't know how they have that authority. Because you gave it to them. You know why you gave it to them? Because you wanted the money. You wanted the bank's money. Does that make sense for everybody? The differences between the lien theory and title theory state? Go ahead. So in the title theory, how quickly can you can the house go on So in, in most title theory states, the different states have different laws regarding this. There's a certain amount of time you have to be late in order to be considered in default. Okay? In North Carolina, that's 90 days late. At any time after you're 90 days late, they can file a notice of default and they can foreclose. <coughs> so in theory, 90 days, they could file. It would probably take them at least another 30 days to process the paperwork. So realistically, 120 days. Late. Four to states, four months late. I'm sorry. How much states title theory state? It's about an even split. 27, I think, title theory and 23 lien theory. Um, generally speaking, um, states in the northeast and west coast tend to be more title theory. States in the southeast and midwest tend to be more lean. I'm sorry, oh, we're right. States in the northeast and west coast tend to be more lean theory. States in the southeast and midwest tend to be more title theory. Um, the exception being Florida. Florida is a lean theory state. Um, I think it's the only one in the southeast. Pretty much everybody else in the southeast practices title theory. Um, uh, California is a lean theory state. Foreclosures in California can take three years. New York is a lean theory state. That one is another one that's notoriously long. Which which state do you think is more friendly to the attorneys? Title really? We don't have to have a lawsuit for title oh, theory. Lean, yeah. Which one do attorneys like? Lean, lean theory court. state. They love racking up those billable hours in court, right? It is not a, so. In some ways, title theory is actually good for both the, the lender and the borrower. Because remember, all those hours that the attorneys bill for in processing these foreclosures, guess where that ultimately gets tacked on? The balance of the loan. The balance of the loan. So ultimately, it's the borrower who's responsible for all those fees, right? Well, I've seen lien theory cases where the attorney's fees were more than the loan balance. You know, where it was a $150,000 loan and there were $175,000 worth of legal fees as a result of the foreclosure. So now the, the, the foreclosure that shows up on their credit report is for $275,000. It's, 
It can happen. It can happen. All right? So does everybody understand the difference here? Now, we call the, the foreclosure process in North Carolina, and all title theory says we call it a power of sale foreclosure, because that's what the trustees have been given. They've been given that authority, that power to take the property and sell it in the foreclosure. Okay? In both kinds of states, we have promissory notes. The promissory note, or just the note, a lot of times we just call this the note. This is the legal contract between the lender and the borrower that says, we're loaning you this much money at this interest rate for this many years, and we expect you to repay it monthly in this amount. It's the contract that says, I owe you money and I promise to pay it back. That's the promissory note. Now does that have anything to do with the property itself, the promissory note? Did I make any mention of the property when I described that document? No. no. The promissory note just says, I understand that I owe you this much money, and I understand this is how you expect me to repay it, and I will repay it, I promise. No mention of the property at all. So if there, why do we record documents in the county courthouse? We record documents that impact the property, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you about recording a promissory note? Do we, do we or do we not record a promissory note? No. No. Because it has nothing to do with real estate. It's an IOU. It's a contract. Does everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. Now, what impacts the real estate when you start talking about a mortgage loan? I don't even know about the name of the document, but what is that four-letter word that we spent a whole lean. chapter talking about? Not lean. 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 It's the lean that impacts the property. We need some way to make this property collateral for that loan that we just signed, right? The note is the loan, but we need another document that makes the property into collateral for that loan. Does that make sense for everybody? Is that document going to be recorded at the county courthouse? Mm -hmm. Yes, because that places the lien on the property. That's public notice that there is a lien attached to this property. And that gives the lender the right to foreclose if that promissory note, that contract, is not upheld. Does that make sense? Deed of trust? No. Deed of trust is what we call that document. Okay. In North Carolina, that document that we record at the courthouse, the one that places the lien on the property, is called a deed of trust. In lien theory states, it gets the much more popular name of mortgage. Mortgages are the document that is recorded in a lien theory state. Deeds of trust are the documents that get recorded in a title theory state. So do we report mortgages in North Carolina? No. No, we report what? A deed of trust. Some people say that they have a mortgage. It's not true. It's a, it, they have a mortgage loan. They have a mortgage loan. If you put that word loan behind it, that is true. Because a mortgage loan is a loan that's collateralized by real estate. You know, so even in North Carolina, we have mortgage loans. But the actual document that's recorded is not called a mortgage in North Carolina. What they have is a deed of trust. But we just all generically call them mortgages, okay? Does everybody get that? Okay. So, essential elements of a valid note. What do we have to have in a promissory note? And this is on page 278 in your textbook. What must be there in a promissory note? Number one, the term. The term is the length of time that we have to repay the entire amount we owe. term is how long we've been given to pay off this amount of money that we just borrowed. What is the most common term for a residential loan in this country? 30 years. 30 years. 
30 years is by far the most common term for a residential mortgage. So what does that mean? That means in most residential mortgages, you're going to be allowed, as a borrower, 30 years to pay that balance down to what? Zero. Zero. At the end of the term, the balance always has to be paid to zero. Does everybody follow that? At the end of the term of any loan, the balance always must be paid to zero. That's what the term is. Okay? You're going to get that confused in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to try to head it <laughs> off at the pass right now. Okay? I'm going to put, bring up something that's not in your book yet at this point in the chapter, but I want you to know about it, okay? There's another number involved with mortgages and the lengths of time. And we never talk about it because in general, for most of you, the kind of loans you will take out, this number and the term are going to be the same length, so it doesn't matter, okay? There's another number called the amortization schedule. The term is what? Tell me what the term is. How long do we have to pay it off? Pay it off means pay it down to what? Zero. Zero. The amortization schedule is how long it would take to pay off at my current payment. Not how long it would take to pay, not how long I have to pay it off, but how long it would take me to pay it off, making the payment I'm making right now. Now, let's go back. What did you say the most common term was for a residential loan? 30 years. 30 years. What do you think the most common, common amortization schedule is for a residential loan? 30 years. That's why we don't say it's a 30-30 loan. We just say it's a 30-year loan, right? Because what that means is the payment we're making right now, it would take us how long to pay it to zero? And coincidentally, how long have they given us to pay it to zero? 30 years. Here's the thing, though, folks, and this is a kick in the pants because you've never thought about it, and you better start thinking about it right now or you'll get every single question in this chapter wrong. That's how important this idea is. They don't have to be the same number. They do not have to be the same number. I'm going to repeat it one more time. They don't have to be the same. Just because it would take you 30 years to pay it off, do I have to give you 30 years to pay it off? No. 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 Could I give you a 7-year term and a 30-year amortization schedule? No. So, how long do I have to pay it down to zero? Seven years is how long I have, a seven-year term, right? Mm -hmm. But the payment, the monthly payment I'm making, how long would it take me to pay it to zero? Thirty. Thirty. So, at the end of seven years, my term's up, right? Mm -hmm. So i got to do what? Show it's got to be at zero, right? right? Have I paid it to zero with those payments I've made in that seven years? No. 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 What do I have left over? Some money. We call that a balloon payment. That's a balloon payment. So, at the end of the term, what do we have to do? Pay it off. How do you pay it off? You do one of two things. Sell it. Well, one of three things. Sell it. Well, hopefully not foreclose. That's, the, that's up to the lender to do. What, one of three things the owner can do. Sell it. <coughs> Pay Refinance it, it or pay it off out of their pocket. Those are their three options. So why do we do that? Why not make it a seven-year term with a seven-year amortization schedule? The payments, would be too high. the payments would be astronomical. Does that make sense? 
Imagine taking your mortgage and shortening it to seven years and what your payments would look like. There's a reason we do 30-year amortization schedules. By the way, in California now, they're doing primarily 50-year amortization schedules. Because real estate's gotten so expensive, people can't afford the house payments. Isn't that insane? So there's a lender. 50 years. Does the lender dictate that? Why not? Oh, sorry. Yeah. You is that negotiable with the lender? Or is the big dictate? In theory, those? everything's negotiable with the lender. In reality, if you want our money, this is the way we'll give it to you. So why does somebody start up with something like that? That's what I, and so that was what we my question. Why would somebody want a shorter term with a longer amortization schedule? Well, they probably wouldn't want the shorter term. Why do they want the longer amortization schedule? Lower payment. Lower payment. The longer the amortization schedule is, the longer it, the, the longer period of time it would take me to pay it off means I'm paying what every month? Smaller, smaller amount. Does that make sense? If I'm paying a smaller amount every month, it's going to take me a much longer time to pay it off. So I want that 30-year amortization schedule because I want to keep my payments as low as possible. I would love to have a 30-year term to pay it off, but the lender is not willing to lend me the money for that long. They don't trust me with their money for that long. And so this is one of those... This is one of those places where you have to detach your mind from what it's attached to. Because right now, every one of them is thinking of a house. Are there other kinds of property in the world? Yeah. yeah. Like what? Like commercial. Commercial, commercial real estate. So, so, remember way back at the beginning of the class, I said there's three main categories of real estate, right? Right. I said there's something you buy so you can live in it. Right. right? There's something... We have the special use properties that are just there for public use, right? And the third category is properties that do what? Income. Produce income. And what you're going to learn when we get to the valuation chapter is that properties that produce income are valued based on how much income they produce, right? The value of the property. Now remember, back up. What's the collateral for these loans? The property, right? So... If the property's value, i.e. the collateral value, is based on income, do we know how much income a shopping center is going to be producing 30 years from now? Yeah. What would be the big concern of a bank given a 30-year amortization schedule on a shopping center? Yeah. The thing may be empty in 30 years. It may be empty in 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. And here... That's all the collateral I've got against this big $5 million loan. So what they want is short terms because they want to revisit the value of this collateral every three, five, seven years. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the lenders in the commercial world are nervous about giving you these long amortization schedules because they don't know what that property is going to be worth. The value of a shopping center can skyrocket in three years and it can bottom out in three years. You could have a shopping center that today is 90% occupied, be 50% occupied three years from now. Does that make sense? And so what's going to happen to the value of that property? It's going to plummet. And the lender doesn't want to have something that's collateral that's not worth the amount of the loan that it's collateralizing. Does that make sense? So they want to revisit this thing. So one way to revisit it is to put a short term on everything. The problem with short terms is nobody can afford the payments on a three-year amortization schedule, right? If we do a three-year note, the payments would be so astronomical, nobody would be affordable. So we do a three-year term with a 20-year, a 30-year amortization schedule. So we make the payments affordable, but we make it so they have to do what at the end of three years? What were our three options again? Refinance, pay it off, or sell it. Does that make sense? Because refinancing is a way of paying it off, right? First thing you do when you refinance is pay off the old one and take out a new one. Coincidentally, do banks also make some fees whenever they take sure. they write new loans? Fees for everything, right? So the more often you refinance, the more fees they collect. That might be a motivation for it, too. Mm -hmm. did, did, did that answer your question? Okay. That's a very important idea because when you get to all these things like, you know, partially amortized loans with balloon payments and all that, 
if you don't understand this right at the jumping off point, then that doesn't make sense an hour from now. Okay, so has everybody got this idea that the amortization schedule and the term can be different things? Now, in mortgage loans, are they generally the same? Yeah. 30-year mortgage loan usually has a 30-year amortization cycle. Okay. It says that the promissory note, in addition to the term, has to have a promise to pay. Well, obviously. It's an IOU, so it's got to have a promise. And it's got to have the signature of the borrower. It does not have to have the signature of the lender. Because the lender is not promising to do anything. Somebody said to me one time, yes, sir, are they promising to own the money? I said, huh, they've already done that. The check's sitting there. They're not promising to do anything except collect. It's the borrower who's promising to do at that point. The lender has already delivered on their promises. Does that make sense? Okay. This bullet point right here is probably right up there with this thing as far as importance. They are, promissory notes are usually a negotiable instrument. And this is one of those times when you have to set aside what you think negotiable means, because it doesn't. It does not mean you can go to the lender and say, I don't like my 6% interest rate, I want to change it. That's not the kind of negotiation we're talking about here. Negotiable in this case means it can be sold. So the promissory note, who owns the promissory note? The lender does, right? So what are we saying the lender can do with this note? Sell the loan. Sell it. We can sell the loan to another creditor. Does the borrower have any control over that process? No. None whatsoever. How many of you have financed your home and a week later you get a notice in the mail of a substitute trustee and your loan had been assigned and sold to somebody else? Yeah. You thought you were going to be making your payments to SunTrust and you find out you're making them to Citibank or Chase. You thought you were going to be making payments to bb and you find out it's Bank of America. Right? And, here's the joy of it, you specifically did not go to Bank of America because you hate dealing with the SOBs. Right. And five minutes after you walked out of the room, they sold it to Bank of America. By the way, sometimes it doesn't even take five minutes. The closing I had this morning, the, the notice of substitute trustee and the assignment of mortgage were actually in the closing package. The loan was literally closed and sold 30 seconds later. So can they be sold? Yes. yes. That's what we mean when we say they are negotiable instruments. Now, what is the only thing that the new, the purchaser of that note, what's the only thing they have to do? They can't change what? The terms, the terms of that contract. They can't change the interest rate. They can't change the term, the length of time. They can't change the amortization schedule. They have to honor the loan as it was written by the original lender. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. But the borrower has zero control over who ultimately holds this note. And I've had borrowers who say, look, you know, I would, as, I'm fine with that as long as it doesn't get sold to such and such because I had them and I don't want to deal with them anymore. And you have to say to that person, you don't have any control over that. And, they're, and they say, well, how, you know, who can I borrow the money from that I, that I can prevent that? Nobody. Because by their very definition, promissory notes are negotiable, which means they can be sold at any time. And even if State Employees Credit Union doesn't sell their notes to Bank of America, that doesn't mean they might not sell it to Citibank. Who does then sell it to Bank of America? You just can't control it. Okay. Is everybody with me on that so far? All right. They are not recorded, as we said earlier, the promissory notes, because they don't have anything to do with the property. Okay? Special note provisions. Highlight this section. Because it's one of those things that doesn't sink in the first time I go through a lecture on it. And it's one of those things, it's the easy, this is the sort of like low-hanging fruit of what to test you on in these chapters. Is knowing what these note provisions are and what they do, what they're there for, what they accomplish. Okay? You're going to see these on test, there's no doubt. An acceleration clause. Every promissory note, for the most part, is going to have something called an acceleration clause in it. If you accelerate, you make something go what? Yeah. Faster. What do you think about a loan we could make go faster if you look at 
this board up here. How long we have to pay it off or how long it would take us to pay off at my current payment? How long, how long to pay it off? How long to pay it off? We can accelerate the term. When would the lender want to accelerate the term and say, you know what, I know I loaned you money for 30 years, but this ain't working out. I want my money now. Not before foreclosure. When you default. When you default on that loan, the lender is not going to say you owe us $3,000 in back payments. They're going to say you owe us $183,000 and we want our money now. Because they don't want to deal with you anymore. You've defaulted. Without an acceleration clause, and here's why it's there. If you were behind by $3,000 on your payments and the lender said, we're going to go to foreclosure next week, what could you do to stop the foreclosure? Catch up. Pay the $3,000. And then they would be suing you saying, they didn't pay us. And the judge is going to say, well, how much do they owe you? They said, well, nothing, but they didn't pay us, but they don't owe you anything, right? But the acceleration clause allows them to say, it doesn't matter whether they owe us anything right now or not. They defaulted in the past, and that gives us the right to say we want all our money right now. Does that make sense for everybody? So every mortgage loan is going to have this acceleration clause. And it makes all of the balance due immediately in the event of a default of the borrower. Okay? The next one is something that used to be common but is not common any longer. A prepayment penalty. So, in theory, what does the lender get out of making a loan? Interest. In theory, lenders make loans so that they can collect interest over the course of however many years the term of the loan has been made, right? Mm -hmm. So if you pay it off early, what did they lose out on? Interest. Interest. So it was very common in years past, and this is pretty many years past now, to have something called a prepayment penalty in mortgage notes. And essentially what that says is we pay this loan off early, you owe us a penalty. Because we didn't get to collect all the interest that we intended to collect. What's the most common reason people pay off early? To avoid paying more interest. But not the most common situation, I guess. And not the like reason. When they're, they're going to sell. Someone dies and they inherit a bunch of money. That's not the most common reason people pay off the mortgage. So you got to think about this stuff. Selling is the second most common reason people pay off their mortgage. How many of you took out one mortgage and kept that mortgage the whole time you owned your house? We finance by far the most common reason. Because when I refinance, what's the first thing I'm doing? I'm taking the new money and I'm doing what with the old loan? Paying it off. So if my loan's got a prepayment penalty, and I refinance my loan, do I have to pay a penalty to do that? No. Yes, no. if it's got a prepayment oh. clause there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. No, okay. That part does, but like, why would you refinance again? Why would you refinance? When I got my loan, interest rates were 12.5%. Okay. That's what I thought. Interest that. rates are 3.5% now, so I'm going to yeah. sit there with my 12.5% loan. Okay, well, I didn't hear that when you just said that. So I was like, wait, what did that's you just why, say? That's why I give you such a big example, because yeah. that's exactly the kind of thing, reason why you would run a refinance, right? If you have, I mean, there's a hundred different reasons to refinance. Maybe I need to pull cash out. You know, maybe I've got 50% equity in my home and I need to put a new roof on it and I don't have the cash to do it. Couldn't I refinance my house and pull some additional equity out? That's the reason to refinance. But any of that requires paying off my old loan, right? The refinance, by definition, is paying off the old, taking out a new. And so that would require a prepayment penalty if we had this clause in the note. Does that make sense for everybody? So those have become very uncommon, and here's the reason. 
the lenders no longer make most of their money on interest. Where do lenders make most of their money now? Selling the loans. Those fees that happen at the time of origination. That origination charge, those discount points, all those fees that a borrower pays to take out a loan, guess where they're going? To the lender. That's the lender's money. So the lenders have figured out, oh yeah, we can sit and we can wait and we can make $3,000 a year in interest and oh, we can make $6,000 refinancing this thing every year. Which one would they rather do? Refinance it every year. They'd rather write new loans. And so, one way to encourage people to write new loans is to take away this penalty for refinance. Is that, does everybody follow that? You have to think the whys and the wherefores of this finance stuff. Because that's the kind of questions you're going to be asked. I don't care if you can say, oh, a prepayment penalty is if they, fight, if they pay it off early. They have to pay <laughs> that is not going to do you a damn bit of good on this exam. None. Because the kind of question you're going to get is about motivations, about why a prepayment penalty would slow down the rate of refinance. You know, those are the kinds of questions you're going to have to answer. Does everybody follow that? Okay. So, not only that reason has taken away prepayment penalties, but if you notice right here, it says prepayment penalties are prohibited on VA and FHA loans. Now, I know we haven't talked about those kinds of loans now. How many of you have ever heard of a VA loan or an FHA loan? These are government-backed loans. These are loans that are made by banks, not made by the federal government. They're made by banks, but they're backed up by the federal government. Okay? And since the federal government is doing the backing up, the federal government gets to set some rules about these loans. Does that make sense to everybody? And one of the rules that the federal government has is that your banks are not allowed to insert prepayment penalties in FHA or VA loans. Well, right now, FHA loans represent about 60% of the national mortgage industry. So that's 60% of mortgages that you can't have a prepayment penalty. VA represents another 10%. So now we're at 70% of mortgages issued every year that can't, by law, have a prepayment penalty. So the other loans, the ones that aren't government-backed, we call them conventional loans, they have to compete with that, right? So, are prepayment penalties very common now? No. No, no they're not. When you say they're backed by the, uh, by the government, what do you mean by that? Like, if Hold on to that question. Okay. Hold on to that question. While you hold on to it, just think to yourself, what would backing up any loan mean? Just think to yourself, what would backing up a loan mean? The lender comes to me and says, look, you, get, you got my back on this loan. What does that mean? If they default, they'll cover it. That, that's exactly what backing it up means. A cosign. It's kind of like the lender's version of cosign, right? Okay? Don't worry about this prohibited in North Carolina on first liens of 150000 or less. That rule used to be a big deal when prepayment penalties were common. And yes, there is a law in North Carolina that says you can't have them on mortgages on single family residential mortgages of less than $150,000, but it doesn't really apply anymore. It does apply, but it doesn't come into play because they're very uncommon now. Okay? Due on sale clauses. This one is the one that I could explain it till I'm blue in the face and some of you just won't get it. And I really can't figure out why because it's a pretty simple thing. I understand what it is. You get the idea of it, but you don't get what it accomplishes, okay? Do on sale. What does that sound like? What does the name sound like? The loan is what? Do when you do what? Sell. sell the property. It's due when you no longer own the property. And that's exactly what this provision says on a loan. That if any time during the term of this loan, you no longer own the property, what has to happen with this mortgage? It has to be paid off. Here's the thing, though. It's, it has another name. It, it's also called an alienation clause. Alienation is the same thing as selling, right? It means I don't own it anymore. That's what alienation is. And it actually has a third name, and
And this is the one where they're going to test you. And this is where it's all going to fall apart for you. It's a non-assumption clause. It's a non-assumption clause. So tell me what you think in your non-financial minds an assumption is on a loan. If you assume someone's loan, what's going on? You're taking over their payments. You're taking over their loan. It's like an assignment of a lease, right? They go away and you come in. Not only have you purchased their property, but you've taken over their loan. Instead of going to get a new loan yourself, you took over that loan. So now, let's talk about motivations, because motivations are what you're going to be tested on. Why would you assume somebody else's loan? Why would I want to take over Dusty's loan instead of getting mine? And let me just tell you that Dusty, when he took out that loan, he took it out in 2014 when interest rates were 3.5%. And we're in 2016, and interest rates are 8.5%. Why, oh, why would I want to assume his loan versus going and getting my new loan at 8.5%? Because his interest rate's better. Does that make sense? If I'm buying his house, wouldn't I much rather buy his house and take over his loan? Because he's paying much less interest. Okay, so that's called the assumption. That's called, no, that's called assumption. Okay. That's an assumption. That's what assumption looks like. I'm buying the house, buying the property, but I'm also taking over the loan. Now, go back to this due on sale clause. The loan is what? No. Due when I do what? Sell. sell it. Dusty's doing what with his house with me? Selling He's selling it to me. So his loan is what? Due. due. Can I assume a loan that's already been paid off? No. No. So an alienation clause or a due on sale clause, what does it prevent? None assumption. assumption. That's where you've got to tie it together on the test. Got, you see why finance is the worst tested area on the thing? Because you've got to think six layers deep in it. That's what we're going to do, though. So if a loan is assumable by some arm, uh, does that new person coming in need to uh, qualify as well? Most likely. So if the loan is assumable, was his question, does the new purchaser who's going to assume the loan need to qualify for that new loan? And the answer is most likely yes. Okay? So, let me ask you a quick question. Would FHA loans have an alienation clause? Well, actually, I didn't tell you that yet. Would, would assumable loans have an alienation clause no. in the no. note? No. no. I just gave you a hint. You think FHA loans are assumable? <laughs> yeah. Yes, they are. So, would FHA loans have an alienation or due on sale clause in the note. They would not. Because what an alienation clause is there for is to prevent assumption. That's the whole point of it. There, what the lender is in essence saying there is we don't even want to give you the opportunity to transfer this loan over to somebody else. When you sell this property, you pay us off and we're out of here. If somebody else wants a new loan from us, they can come to us and get a new loan. Does that make sense for everybody? Because yeah. assumption is a loser for the lenders. Would they rather me be able to take over Dusty's 3.5% loan or make me get a new loan at 8.5%? Yeah. They'd, they'd rather. So pretty much the only time you're not going to see an alienation clause is when the law makes it illegal for there to be an alienation clause. The law made it illegal for there to be prepayment penalties on what kind of loans? Yeah. FHA and VA, so do you think the law might be similar in that regard for mm -hmm. alienation clauses, that FHA and VA loans are by law fully assumable loans? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Is everybody okay? Yeah, have I lost you completely? Mm -hmm. All right. I promise this is really as simple as I can make it. I mean, and I get that it's a very foreign thing. Most people just have never dealt with finance before. But I, this is about as lowest common denominator as we can go with it. I'm trying to tie it all together for you. That's why it's such a slow trek through it. All right? I know I'm beating it to death, and I'll come back and beat it again at some point. Okay? Principal and interest payments. Actually, before we do that, um, 
Let's take a five minute break and you